Complacency kills victory. Don't accept undesirable circumstances. We have the victory to overcome every circumstance. Arkansas Alive starts right now. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Arkansas Alive. I appreciate you joining us for today's edition. All this week, we're starting off victory to overcome every circumstance. Now, I believe the teaching has already ministered to you, renewed your mind, given you inspiration and information. And we'll pick up here today where we left off yesterday in Proverbs our, our point today, our bullet point today, or this, or yesterday and today, was guard against complacency. The dumbing down of the culture has produced complacency in people's lives. They don't demand anything extraordinary. They don't demand uh, excellence. They don't demand diligence. So we, we've, we've been dumbed down to accept anything in our life and, uh, you know, be tolerant and, and so forth where we've misconstrued the meaning of tolerance and so forth. We've, we've tolerated things that we shouldn't have. We've been complacent with where we are. Uh, we're not challenged to, to go any further. The church has been dumbed down also. It's, it's amazing to me how this whole thing has been reversed. Uh, the church in the beginning days was an impact, an influence on the culture. Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he said the gospel is the power of God. And that's what we have to realize. The reason he said to preach the gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And, and what the church has done, by and large, I'm talking about generally speaking, what the church has done, the church has succumbed to the world. The church is not imparting and influencing the world anymore. The world is influencing the church. The church looks just like the world in many cases, inside and out. It's hard to tell the difference between a Christian and a sinner anymore because of their habits, their, their dress, their outlook on life, their language. I mean, it's hard to distinguish whether somebody's a Christian anymore because the church wrongly thinks that they're going to attract the world by looking like the world, tolerating. We've become complacent. Sin no longer bothers us. Error no longer bothers us. And so we have dumbed ourselves down. We, we've... We, I know uh, Jesse DePlantis made this statement at a minister's conference that he and I were ministering in, and he made the statement that he had been in a church where he said they had to have a flashlight to lead him to his seat on the front row because he said the church was so dark you couldn't see past the front row. And they had to have a flashlight to show him his seat. And he said when the service started, then they had smoke machines that came out and filled the auditorium with smoke. And so Jesse asked the pastor, he said, what? What's going on here? And the pastor told him this. He said, we're trying to create an atmosphere. He said, what kind of atmosphere? <laughs> he said, look, and you've heard Jesse's testimony. He says, look, I was raised in rock music. I was raised in nightclubs and concert halls. and probably. He said, are you trying to create that kind of atmosphere? In other words, he, he insulted the pastor. He offended him. He said, look, I, I came out of that. That's, that's the world. He said, we're, we're light. We're not darkness. I've experienced the same thing. I've been in churches. I didn't know they existed. I've just heard people talk about it. But the more Jeannie and I travel, the more we see they, they do exist. Now, they're the minority, thank the Lord. Where And there, there are now churches and ministries that promote uh, drinking alcohol. One whole denomination at their annual gathering, whatever it was, they, some of the people moved that they start putting in their doctrine to, to accept, allow the ministers to drink wine. I mean, the, we've become complacent with sin and complacent with things that the Bible teaches the direct opposite. We've been, we've been jammed down our throat, forced down our throat to be tolerant of every lifestyle, every 
sexual preference. The Bible does not teach that. And you have a lot of Christians that are adopting the philosophy, live and let live. Oh, we're to be tolerant. That shows the world uh, that we're good people. No, it doesn't. And besides that, you're not trying to, <laughs> you're not trying to attract uh, the world's endorsement anyway. You're not, you're not trying to uh, attract the world by looking like the world. Jesus never did that. Jesus, in Paul's, gospel, Paul's writings in the, in Corinth, to the Corinthian church, he said, come out from among them and be ye separate. We're, we're the redeemed. We're supposed to be sanctified, separated people. Not holier than thou, not with a judgmental attitude, not legalistic, not proud and boastful, and none of those things. But you, you, can't, you can't comply to the world's standard without becoming complacent, complacent of spiritual things. You'll never grow. You'll never fulfill God's assignment and call on your life. You don't have to be ugly about it. You just have to set a standard, walk in love. And, and you know, it's not look at me, how holy I am. That's not the point at all because <laughs> none of us are totally perfect. We're perfect in Christ, but we're still working on ourselves. We're still uh, being thoroughly finished. There's a finishing project here. We're, we're, we're continuing to work to be, uh, you know, demonstrate our identity in Christ. But complacency kills all of that. Complacency stops your spiritual growth. So guard against complacency. Let's look again at Proverbs uh, Proverbs has a lot of examples. I just pulled out a few. This is a good one here. Proverbs 23, 17. Let not your heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end. Now the marginal reference says a reward. There's a reward for living in victory. There's a, a reward for not being complacent. There's a reward for being holy and godly. He says, and surely there is an end, a reward, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Wow, where did that come from? I'm glad you asked. Go over to <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11. Here's God. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Uh, that word expected end uh, refers to a reward, an end, an expectation. But complacency robs you of all of this. If you become complacent, you are not going to overcome. There's nothing to overcome when you're complacent. When you accept status quo, everything's the same. You, you, you think you're being humble, but you're really being ignorant. Uh, you don't want to grow. You don't want to become uh, more of what God wants you. You don't want to possess what, more of what God wants you. you. You've become complacent. But notice it says there and over in Proverbs, it said that there is a reward. Go back to it again and, and read with me. Proverbs 23 and verse 18. For surely there is an end, a reward. Your expectation shall not be cut off. You say, well, Pastor Cole, I'm just really not interested in, in anything in this world anymore. Hey, join the club. I'm not either. This world has nothing uh, that I want. I'm talking about the world system. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the earth hath he given to the sons of men. Now, I, I, I'm all for, I'm not, a, I'm not talking a tree hugger here, but I'm all for the beauty of the creation. He's given us authority over the creation to take care of it, to preserve it. Uh, I'm not, uh, again, I'm not talking about an environmentalist, so to speak, the way it's being presented. But I'm talking about our assignment is not this world system. So when you read this, it says, there's an end, your expectation shall not be cut off. I'm in expectation for everything that God has for me here in this earth. I live in the world system, but I'm not of the world system. Uh, I love the earth. I love the creation. 
there is no such person as Mother Nature, you understand. <laughs> uh, we, we talk about Father Christmas and Mother Earth and uh, Mother Nature and all that. There, no, those are uh, figurative terms, but some people believe that and they worship them. They worship the earth. You're to worship God. I remember the first time I went to Israel with Dr. Lester Summerall, and, the, you know, everybody, you know, started talking about um, Israel, uh, the Holy Land, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And Brother Summerall was very blunt and open, opinionated, but very biblically correct. He said, there's no, there's no land that's holy. He said, only God is holy. And if there's any land that's holy, it's because God's been there. But people get all bent out of shape to begin to worship the land, the traditions, the statues, the places. <laughs> one funny uh, illustration, one time we were, we went with Brother Summerall to Israel five years in a row, five different times, and took tour groups with us. And one day, Brother Summerall had a meeting with all the tour guides. At one time, we had about five buses, which is really too many. But we had about five buses loads of people. And, uh, you know, sometimes the guides, and, and we used all Israeli guides. These are all university-trained Israeli guides. And so uh, they knew the Bible mentally backwards and forwards, Old and New Testament. And uh, our, our, our tour guide, we got to know him pretty well. We loved him. Jeannie treated him like a son. And... Um, his name was Natan, Natan Amari, Nathan, and he was the he was the son of uh, rabbis. And um, Brother Summerall gathered them all together one day, and he said, "Now look," he said, "these pilgrims have come over here to Israel, a trip of a lifetime. Most of them will only be here one time." He said, "I don't want to hear any more about this. Could be the place, or this might be the place." or this is tradition of the place. He said, I don't want to hear any more about that. He said, if you talk about a historical site, he said, I want to hear you say, this is the place. And of course, there are different opinions, uh, you know, where the, um, where, the, where the Christ child was born. It was either uh, here or there. There's, a, you know, there's different opinions about these places. So the tour guys were trying to be open and honest, didn't want to make any, you know, uh, ultra statements and so they were trying to give themselves a room but Brother Summer says no this is the place so the next day we were going <laughs> out to where David slew Goliath and it's long, along a little creek bank and it's nothing but round rocks river rocks and so Natan runs out of the bus he runs over to the creek and he grabs the, uh, this, this stone and he holds it up to the crowd and he says, Uppy, that's what he used to call me, Uppy. He said, Uppy, I have found the stone that slew Goliath. <laughs> and, and of course, we all laughed. But, it, you know, there's no ground that's holy unless was, that God was there. And, and, and it's, it's only holy because of God. There's, no, there's no, holy, no holy this and holy that. And the only place in Israel where they've not built a church over it, all the holy sites, is the Sea of Galilee, and they can't do that because it's too big. But it's only holy because God was there, because Jesus was there. So, you know, there, there, there's an expectation in this life, and there's an expectation in heaven. These rewards don't always show up here. John Osteen used to preach, uh, preach a message that, you know, God don't settle up every Saturday night. There are some things that you're going to be rewarded for and your expectation is going to come to full fruition in heaven. So everything that you're working on, your assignment, your, whatever you're doing, you may get rewarded in this life, you may get rewarded in the next life. But if you guard against complacency and you overcome every situation in your own life, hey, that's a big victory. When you overcome pride and prejudice and, and, and uh, self-centeredness and, uh, you know, learn to control your tongue, when you overcome the sins of the flesh, when you overcome those sins that, that beset you, as it says in Hebrews 12, when you overcome those things, that's, that's a place to rejoice. That's, that, that's a time for rejoicing. 
But when you overcome the circumstances that are around you, that's another place and a time to rejoice. And let me just say this. Once you overcome in a particular situation, generally speaking, you won't have to overcome that again. Once you've overcome it, you've passed it, and you go on to bigger and better things. Okay, <clears throat> one more scripture. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that was the last scripture, guard against complacency. Let's go to the next one now. Don't accept undesirable circumstances. You say, well, these circumstances are beyond my control. No, they're not. Usually when we say that, now remember, we're talking about victory to overcome every circumstance. Well, these circumstances are beyond my control. We, what we mean when we say that is, you know, this, this circumstance is uh, brought on by somebody else or some corporation or some rule or law. These circumstances are beyond my control. No, they're not. They may be a product of some corporate uh, rule or some uh, regulation or governmental regulation or whatever. They may be, but everything is subject to God. Everything is subject to change. You've heard me tell when VTN began, when we bought our first station, got ready to build. Actually, we bought a permit to build. We built the first station, Channel 25, right here in Pine Bluff, Little Rock. Uh, there were 22 objections filed against our tower site. The FCC and the FAA noted that there were 22 objections to our tower site in England, and they wouldn't, you know, um, uh, approve our tower site until these objections were, were dealt with. So one by one, we set out, and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, 22 objections, what are we going to do? And you could have said, these are circumstances beyond our control. What do we do, fold up our tent and go home? No. God said, this is what I want, this is what I've given you, this is your assignment, and so we went to work on every objection. And when we finally waded into all of it and began to deal with it, and we had the victory. FAA and FCC approved our tower site anyway. Victory to overcome every circumstance. Let me, let me show you something. Just because a door is shut doesn't mean that's God. And just because a door is opened doesn't mean that's God. Those are all sense ruled. Those are all evidential. Those are all circumstantial. And, you know, God doesn't operate that way. If a door is closed, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not supposed to go through it. The devil could have closed that door. If you know you're supposed to go through that door, what do you do? You kick it open in the name of Jesus. But you better be sure you're following the Holy Ghost. Oh, what if a door is open? Oh, I tell you what, this, this has got to be God. The door opened for me, and, and I know that's God. Not necessarily Satan could have opened that door to trip you up. Now you're confused. You say, oh, my goodness, Pastor, what am I going to, how am I going to know? Ah, <laughs> like Paul said, I couldn't speak to you as a carnal. I mean, as spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. But uh, I couldn't speak to you as under spiritual, but as of the carnal Carnal Christians, sense-ruled Christians, need evidence. They, they need a fleece. They need physical evidence. But God doesn't always operate that way. Why? God is not carnal. God's not physical. He's spiritual. He's spirit. And the Bible says those of the sons of God are to be led by the Spirit of God, not by open doors or closed doors. So what if the door is open? You don't know whether that's God or the devil. But you know if you know the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will let you know, yes, this is an open door and this door is of God. Go through it. Or the Holy Spirit may tell you like he did Paul in the book of Acts when they heard a man uh, holler in the spirit. They heard a man say, come over to Macedonia and preach the word over here. And the Holy Spirit said, no. Here's an open door. Here's an opportunity. Preachers, listen to me. Just because you get invited to preach somewhere does not necessarily mean that's God. I remember Brother Hagin used to tell the story about how he pastored for 12 years. And he said, I was out of the will of God 
the perfect will of God for 12 years. He said, because God never called me to pastor. He said, I was called as an evangelist. And he said, uh, the only reason I pastored those 12 years is because I didn't know how to follow God. He said, and I just prayed, Lord, if you want me to pastor this church, let me get a 100% vote. And, and in, that, in that day, in the 40s, in that particular denomination, uh, when they'd call a pastor, you had to get a majority of the board or the deacons or elders, whoever was the corporate makeup of the church. And he said, let me get a 100% vote. And he said, I got a 100% vote. So that must have been the will of God. <laughs> and he said, I found that it wasn't. Just because you get a 100% vote doesn't mean it's the will of God. And he said, Brother Hagin said, he said, I missed God for 12 years. He said, I was never called to be a pastor. He said, I pastored, but I wasn't called to be a pastor. That is really important. There are a lot of people that are pastoring churches today that weren't called. They chose it as a profession. They were good at public speaking. They loved people. Uh, you know, they supposed that this is what they wanted. Some of them chose it. But the Bible tells us that you have to be called. That's the primary prerequisite for ministry is to be called. You know, not just show up, not just choose, but to be called. So according to the scriptures, we don't want to accept um, undesirable circumstances. We want to know how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And that way we'll always have the victory to overcome every situation. Whenever you are in a ministry that God's calling you to, and don't misunderstand me, I'm not talking about five-fold ministry. Every one of you watching today, if you're a believer, you have been called into the ministry of reconciliation, to reconcile people to God. Find it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21. You've been given the ministry of rec reconciliation. Every believer is to, to share the gospel, make disciples, teach and preach, lay hands on the sick. It says, whosoever believeth. These are the signs that follow those who believe. Not just the fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, but every believer. So don't accept undesirable circumstances. Uh, go with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 now, and we'll look at some scriptures that deal with that statement. Don't accept undesirable circumstances. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Even though your outward man gets tired, weary, physical demands. Watch this. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Your circumstances are temporary. Now, we're going to pick this up here tomorrow. Be sure and join us. Don't accept undesirable circumstances. They're subject to change. But right now, I want to point you towards this spot. The March for Life is coming up in just, for a, few, in just a few weeks. And here's why you need to know about it. Watch this and I'll be right back. Each year in January, we gather because the March for Life commemorates the anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion in our country and has taken the lives of 60 million unborn children. In 1973, when Roe v. Wade was decided, it overturned all the laws protecting unborn human life in all 50 states and said that a woman could have an abortion uh, unregulated during the first three months. And then after that, a state could have an interest in regulating abortion. Uh, but in fact, it did legalize abortion through all nine months of pregnancy for any reason, at any time 
and that's what abortion is. It's abortion on demand. I have an honor of being both a state representative and president of Arkansas Right to Life. Um, the life issue is the biggest to me. It's at the very foundation. If we can't trust our elected officials to protect life, the most innocent of life, then what else can we trust them with? Well, do you want to trust them with the economy or jobs or anything else if they can't see past that very foundational uh, decision to protect innocent human life? The 40th Annual March for Life will be Sunday, January 21st, 2018, 2 p.m. The actual starting point of the march is Capitol and Wolf Streets, but the staging actually starts between Battery Streets and Wolf Streets. So if we would have the crowd gather up behind the Capitol on, Cap on um, Capitol Street, between Wolf and Battery, and then at 2 o'clock the, the march will step off. We uh, march down Capitol Avenue. When we get to the back of the Capitol, we split into two groups, circle the Capitol, and come back up together on the steps where we'll have a short program. You know, this is a central gathering place for thousands of Arkansans from all over the state to come and show their support for life. Life beginning at conception through a natural death. Uh, we know that all life is valuable. It comes from God and, and we want to protect those innocent unborn living children. Last year at the March for Life, we talked about a ban on dismemberment abortion, a very gruesome procedure where they literally rip a child apart piece by piece, arms and legs and such as that. At this March for Life last year, Governor Hutchinson promised that if it made it to his desk, he would sign it into law. Our conservative legislature passed that bill. Governor Hutchinson signed it. Uh, the courts, uh, it's in the court system right now. It was promised to be challenged and it has been. And Attorney General Leslie Rutledge is defending that right now. She's going to be our featured speaker at this year. Year's March for Life. Our speaker this year, we're very excited to have our Attorney General Leslie Rutledge, who, you know, is a, a fighter for life. She does not give up. She is um, fighting for the laws that we pass in Arkansas to protect life. You know, we are the only state to successfully defund Planned Parenthood from receiving any tax dollars, and that's a great um, thanks that we have to our governor. Asa Hutchinson, and to our Attorney General Leslie Rutledge that, uh, you know, fought those legal battles um, that Planned Parenthood challenged that, that decision from the governor. You always hear the other side. And those of us who believe that life be begins at conception and that it's important and it's invaluable that we protect it, we've got to be heard as well. We're in the majority but we don't need to be the silent majority. We need to be vocal in that support and persuade others as well. We've got a lot to be thankful for, but still a lot of babies are still dying from abortion. So we're gonna keep marching until we have to, don't have to march anymore. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Andy. The March for Life is Sunday, January 21st at 2 p.m. at the Arkansas State Capitol. For more information, call area 501 663 4237 or go online artl.org and I encourage everybody to uh, join all the believers all over Arkansas. Join me again tomorrow. Remember overcoming every circumstance. Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com.